let me first of all introduce myself. I'm uh, Gary Simpson. I'm a professor of international law here at the LSC, and I'll be chairing this event. So first of all, let me just offer a tiny bit of background on the subject. Um, in Roskilde, Denmark, on December the 1st, 1967, the International War Crimes Tribunal, known as the Russell Tribunal, and named after its, one of its creators, Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher, um, found the United States guilty on all charges, including genocide, the use of forbidden weapons, uh, maltreatment and killing of prisoners, violence and forceful movement of prisoners in Vietnam and its neighbors, Laos and Cambodia. <coughs> This was, of course, a significant moment in the history of resistance to the Vietnam War in the 1960s, but it was also a moment when the idea of establishing um, tribunals as a form of political activism was born, and it may have even been an inspiration for the current round of international war crimes tribunals in The, in the Hague and elsewhere. So we wanted to commemorate the 50th anniversary of this founding moment, and I want to acknowledge Tor Crever's uh, role in coming up with the idea and uh, always the more difficult bit, actually implementing it too. So thank you, Tor. And thank you to Simone Davis, who's I think somewhere here uh, for engineering the whole thing. There she is. So let me introduce the speakers first, and um, then I'll explain how the night uh, will proceed. First of all, Tariq Ali. Uh, who will probably be very well known to many of you, is a writer and filmmaker. He has written more than two dozen books on world history and politics, and seven novels translated into over a dozen languages, as well as scripts for the stage and screen. But more than this, he is just a figure who's been around for me since I became aware that there was such a thing called politics. Uh, a tireless literary and urbane voice of left activism and political life in general here in the UK and elsewhere. His most recent books include The Dilemmas of Lenin, Terrorism, War, Empire, Love, Revolution, and The Extreme Center, A Warning. And before that, there was Bush in Babylon and The Clash of Fundamentalisms. I remember early books, too, on socialism, published in, in the midst of the Thatcher era and on the Chilean revolutionary experiment. But we have Tariq here uh, today because he played a key role in the Russell Tribunal as part of one of the fact-finding missions that were sent to Vietnam in 1967 to investigate the possibility of war crimes and so on. Tor Craver, uh, on my far left, is an assistant professor in the School of Law, University of Warwick. His current research develops a materialist history of maritime piracy in international legal thought. His broader research interests include critical and Marxist approaches to international law, political economy, and international development, and left legal theory. Tor is an editor of the London Review of International Law, and a plug for two superb essays of Tor's in the New Left Review, um, a demolition job on the pre project of international criminal law, which many of you are studying at the moment, and a very sharp assessment of David Kennedy's uh, world of struggle. Aicha Chibukchu is assistant professor in human rights in the Department of Sociology and the Center for the Study of Human Rights here at the LSE. Aicha has written on Hannah Arendt and the question of humanity. Her most recent publication in Tours London Review of International Law is called Thinking Against Humanity. And um, she has a book forthcoming with the University of Pennsylvania Press, very much on point for us tonight, called For the Love of Humanity, the World Tribunal on Iraq and the Politics of Solidarity. Jayan Nayar is associate professor at the University of Warwick. His main research interests are in the fields of international law, human rights and development, social movements, and theories of nonviolent resistance. Jayan was a member of the International Coordinating Committee of the World Tribunal on Iraq Initiative. He has written about people's tribunals in an essay entitled People's Law, Decolonizing Legal Imagination. Recent essays include, and I really like the titles here, on the elusive subject of sovereignty and some thoughts on the extraordinary, on philosophy, coloniality, and being um, otherwise. So, uh, mobile phones off. 
fire exits at the back. Um, here's how we'll proceed. Uh, Tor will engage uh, Tariq in a conversation about his experiences with the Russell Tribunal. Um, Aicha Jayan and I will then have a conversation about the afterlife of the Russell Tribunal and other tribunals uh, created afterwards. And then we'll um, open it up to the audience for questions. Tor. Thank you, Gary. It would be remiss of me to not point out that you're a fellow editor of the London Review of International Law. This is so. Uh, so, Tarek, you arrive in Britain from Pakistan in 63, uh, is it, to study at Oxford, and you're immediately thrown into the, the sort of center of activism around the Vietnam War. And um, you quickly become a central figure in that both nationally but also internationally, right? You, you famously debate Kissinger and his acolytes at Harvard around the, the war. Uh, and and, and it's, I think it's important to recognize that this tribunal, which is often thought about, at least amongst lawyers, as this very legalistic thing, takes place in the context of a mass political movement against the Vietnam War. But I, I'm curious, how is it that you originally become involved in the tribunal? Is it I think in your memoirs, uh, an excellent book, um, Street Fighting Times, uh, your reflections of the 60s, you talk about having written uh, to the, the Observer, I think, complaining about their, their terrible coverage of the, the Vietnam War, the Observer and the Guardian. Uh, and um, they published your, essay, your, your, your letter and wrote a terrible response. Uh, and Russell himself wrote to you, uh, but it's actually through Ralph Schoenemann, Schoenemann, if I'm not mistaken, that you become acquainted with, with Russell and the tribunal. Well, I got this letter from Burton Russell out of the blue, and for those of you uh, who were students <clears throat> and barely know who Burton Russell was, probably, he was one of the great philosophers produced uh, in this country, a conscientious objector during the First World War, uh, a very radical figure who got more and more radical as he uh, grew older. Uh, he came from an incredibly aristocratic family, Russell Square, which you'll find uh, is named after his family. And the Russell Hotel was the only hotel we could get in London to allow us to publicize the War Crimes Tribunal and throw a press conference. All the other hotels banned us because it was considered improper. Uh, so we used uh, uh, Russell's uh, background in this. Um, and Bertrand Russell had set up a peace foundation where all the money from his royalties used to accrue. Uh, it went straight to the peace foundation. And uh, since he was a very successful author and winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, he, his book sold. So that's the background. I was uh, asked by the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation to do a number of things for them. <clears throat> but in, in the office. And I met Russell, and he informed me that they were going to set up a war crimes tribunal. And to, to set it in perspective, you've got to understand it wasn't just Russell. It's known as the Russell Tribunal because Bertrand Russell was a sort of global figure. But in fact, there were two European, uh, two philosophers, <coughs> Bertrand Russell from Britain and Jean-Paul Sartre from France, who put out the first appeal for the War Crimes Tribunal. And Sartre played not so much an organizing role, but a very important political, ideological, intellectual role in justifying the creation of a war crimes tribunal to try the world's largest and most powerful country for war crimes. No one was doing it. Where did the idea, so in, in your memoirs you hint that, that it was actually Schoenman, the secretary, right, who, who came up with the idea. Yes, I think the idea came from Burton Russell's secretary, uh, <clears throat> who was uh, an American citizen, um, very Contra controversial figure on the Very left, controversial right? figure, very hardline, hated what his country was doing to Vietnam, and happened to be a philosophy student who Russell liked because he was a maverick. Uh, and 
It was his idea to set up a war crimes tribunal modelled on the Nuremberg Tribunal. And Justice Jackson's opening words at the tribunal were quoted by the war crimes tribunal, and it said, you can't be absolved by saying we were obeying orders. That is a thing the tribunal uh, rejected. And it was Ralph Sherman who, who came up with the idea, but none of us thought at that time that it would take off. Why it took off is because uh, Sartre and uh, Bertrand Russell had enormous prestige, certainly in Europe, and, to, you know, and Russell himself was very well known in the United States as well. So that is how the tribunal was set up, and then I think both Russell and Sartre agreed on the other members of the tribunal, the mm. people who actually sat mm. <clears throat> at the tribunal, and it was a very varied list. There's uh, uh, Mahmoud Ali Kasuri, who was a brilliant criminal lawyer in Pakistan, who later became Minister of Law and wrote the Constitution of the country in the um, late 60s, early 70s. What I think was even your suggestion. It, that was my suggestion that they have him because he is a very brilliant human rights lawyer, defended the poor free of charge, defended political prisoners without taking a penny, uh, made his money from the rich like many lawyers do, but was very, he had a real conscience and he looked a bit like Orson Welles as the Playboy report on the War Crimes Tribunal noted. Uh, and much to his consternation and his wife's anger, but never mind. Uh, and then there was Vladimir Dedije, the great uh, historian uh, from Yugoslavia. Um, th there were people from uh, all over the world. So it was an international war yeah. crimes tribunal. David Dellinger from the uh, American pacifist uh, peace movement. Baldwin. Uh, hmm? Baldwin. James Baldwin. Yes. Carmichael. Yes. Carmichael wasn't on it. Oh, he wasn't? Oh, maybe no. he was, he was I think, aired as hmm? well. He's listed in some of the yeah. documents as yeah. present. He, well, no, we wanted Carmichael and Jimmy Baldwin to come on. But for some reason, I can't remember now what happened. They were totally supportive. Mm -hmm. But they, I think they, it was some te legal technicality which made them nervous of uh, coming on. They had enough trouble as it was. Uh, but uh, so it, uh, And of course, uh, while Bertrand Russell was too old to preside over the tribunal, Jean-Paul Sartre, presided over it, and Simone de Beauvoir was a member of the tribunal, uh, played quite an active role. Uh, it was uh, Simone de Beauvoir who said of Ralph Sherman that he's the only man I've met <coughs> who grows a beard to hide a strong chin. <laughs> Not a weak one. Uh, so there were tensions in how it was organized, but ultimately it got going. And... Uh, very little publicity. You have to remember this. Those were pre, you know, long, long before the internet was even dreamt of. So we had no, very little publicity in the mainstream press and media. It was covered, but usually very critically, and attacked for even daring to do this. Uh, the aim had been to do it, have it in France. Uh, de Gaulle didn't permit it. Then we tried Britain, where the Labour government in power with Harold Wilson said they were not going to permit it. Uh, Germany was tried, the site of the Nuremberg Tribunal. There was an idea to have it in Nuremberg. The Germans said, please don't embarrass us. Uh, this is our ally. Uh, and finally, Sweden agreed. It and, was and Sartre quite engaged with, with uh, de Gaulle's refusal, right? Quite, quite vocally, and, and I think there was an exchange of letters in the, the mainstream press even, right? Yes, Sartre uh, attacked de Gaulle very harshly for refusing to allow the tribunal to meet in, in France. Uh, and indeed, so Wilson was fairly predictable, right? Britain, the Labour Party was... Supporting the war. Supporting the war. De Gaulle, at least privately to Sartre, if I'm not mistaken, said he didn't support the war, but they weren't going to be embarrassed by this, right? Yeah, it's, we were quite surprised by that. De Gaulle said, um, 
De Gaulle did oppose the war, and actually quite strongly, it has to be said. So there was no question that almost the entire, you know, Le Monde was completely opposed to the war. Some of the best reports from Vietnam were published in uh, Le Monde, and even Figaro's coverage was pretty strong compared to the British press, where the coverage was weak. The New York Times was weak. They had some decent reporters. But in terms of covering the war crime, that was going too far. They regarded it as an exaggeration. Mm. Um, so, well, Let's jump back slightly in time to when you're asked prior to the actual meetings by Russell Sherman to go to Vietnam on a fact-finding mission. Well, actually, I guess it's Campuchia at the time and Vietnam. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we had to have teams of people going into Vietnam uh, via Campuchia in order to bring back evidence, take photographs, uh, talk to people, victims, see with our own eyes what was going on. And uh, very few people went to North Vietnam in those days. 99% of journalists covering the war did it from South Vietnam, from the American side, basically. Uh, the, I don't know how many of you may have seen the documentaries recently shown on the BBC on the Vietnam War. But the coverage and the footage, in the main, is from the uh, one side. Mm -hmm. You know, the North Vietnamese covered the war. Uh, their footage was shown in China, Russia, very rarely, if ever, shown on uh, Western networks. So the entire coverage came from the West of the war, which people saw. It was much better than anything we've seen recently on Iraq or Libya or Syria. Or the, now it's incredibly biased. The coverage of the Vietnam War, I would say, was biased in favor of the United States. But you occasionally had very good journalists who just defied convention. I mean, I remember, uh, I think it was Morley Safe on CB, CBS in the United States made a, a report which was shown on the BBC as well, in which he said, uh, I'm with a group of US Marines, we're going into the jungles, uh, and he said, you know, he actually said, and now we, I'm going to show you, I can't remember the exact words, how we fight for freedom and democracy. And they blowtorched and burnt uh, houses with women, children in them, because most of the guerrilla fighters were not there and children rush, running out of these houses on fire. And Morley Safer said, this is how we're fighting for freedom and democracy. This was shown without being cut at all on American television. And it's because of those experiences that they've become very strict on what can be shown and not shown, where journalists are allowed. There were no restrictions on journalists going anywhere. Mm. I mean, some were killed. So we were sent to North Vietnam to bring back evidence. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well having, when we arrived in uh, the flight from Cambodia to Vietnam, uh, we, there was only one flight, that was the flight of the International Control Commission that had been set up by the UN. It was their plane. And before we boarded the plane in Laos, um, we were made to sign a document saying, in the case this plane crashes, there's an accident, or we are blown up, uh, your family has no right to claim any compensation. <laughs> so we said, that's the least of our problems if we've been blown up. So we all, we all signed this happily. And they said that the people most likely to blow it up were the Laotian guerrillas, the Pathat Lao because they'd been bombed so heavily by the Americans that they fired at anything that they saw in the air. So they said, when we go above Laos, keep your fingers crossed, which we did. And arriving in Hanoi under cover of darkness at night, we didn't know where we were going to land because uh, during the day the bombing was too severe. So we landed at night, and just as the plane grew down, the lights went on for a sort of a minute or two minutes so he could see the landing strip and we landed and the lights went off 
and the people who came to greet us came with kerosene lamps and candles, not even torches, which could be seen. So that's how it started. And um, I, I remember on my team, there was a French physician, Dr. Abraham Behar. Uh, there was an American, uh, Carol Brightman, a student, editor of the Viet Report, an anti-war thing. Um, there was a Dominican Republic a doctor, Gustavo <coughs> Tolentino. Um, and the Scottish labor activist. And the great Scottish trade union miners leader, Lawrence Daly, uh, who uh, you know, had brought along a bottle of whiskey to give to Ho Chi Minh, the president of Vietnam. But by the time we got there, Lawrence had consumed most of it himself. <laughs> so you... In the memoir, you talk about sort of the, the quite, quite moving, disturbing, traumatic even things that you saw. And in the, the report that you compiled for the tribunal, I just want to read part of it because it's quite, quite striking. You, you wrote that, uh, so the part of the province which had been bombed almost without respite was Dingina. I'm almost certainly pronouncing that wrong, uh, district. We traveled there during the night. The next day was the most depressing day I spent in Vietnam. I saw bombed schools and hospitals. They had been direct hits. There could be no doubt whatsoever that this was deliberate. This was the story in almost every village I'd visited. These were not military targets, and the United States could not but be aware of this fact. It was target bombing of civilians was very deliberate. Look, it happened during the Second World War as well. As, as uh, many of you know, Dresden was bombed <coughs> as a punishment bombing. Uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were nuked as a punishment to the Japanese, you know, innocent people, uh, many of whom were forced into fighting war, conscripted by force, were punished, whereas the leaders who had carried out these wars including the emperor of Japan, were more or less left untouched. Not more or less, completely left untouched, instead of being taken before a war crimes tribunal. Because they needed them for the next round of the, of, of the first round of the Cold War, and they didn't want to destabilize these countries too much. So uh, it was very depressing, the experience. But you know, I, I have to say something, which is an awful thing to say, that the first week I was there, we were bombed every day, almost. And you saw the immediate aftermath of the bombing of civilians, and the bombs that were dropped, designed to harm and kill and maim children, because they, 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 they used to drop bombs shaped like guavas or like pineapples which lay there in the ground until some child, thinking it's a ball or something, picked it up and it exploded. They were called guava bombs and pineapple bombs. And they were designed for that purpose. Um, so to see that, and you know, to see it every day and to see the effects of chemical war and chemical weapons that were used, napalm bombing, children with, without arms, children with their bodies burned, women burned, men burned. It was quite depressing. And then after two weeks, it's horrific, but you get used to it. It's awful. You just, like the Vietnamese, they used to say, don't, don't be too upset. You know, we live here. And we, were, we are upset too, but life has to go on. So there was no shortage of evidence and Something that struck me in, in your memoir, reflecting on this experience, was the, the fact that the, the Vietnamese, you, know, you were meeting villagers, civilians affected by this, none of them had any animosity towards the American people themselves, right? It was directed towards the state. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. They, <clears throat> they said, we know who is doing this. I mean, they, they basically repeated what they were listening to on radio. Uh, every day. This is what was the line of the Vietnamese uh, government, North Vietnamese government, uh, that we don't blame the ordinary American people. We know many of them are opposed to this war. The Americans aren't our enemy, it's their government. Always made a very fine distinction. Uh, and, you know, as the American anti-war movement grew and grew and grew, uh, they, they were vindicated <coughs> in this approach. Um, so, and they would, uh, I remember listening to tapes they had made, because I heard some, um, what they used to, sh you know, s s uh, shout through the loudspeakers where the American troops could hear them. 
And it was incredibly clever. They would make direct appeals to African-American soldiers, saying, what are you doing here killing us? You should see what's happening in your own country. Have you forgotten the lynchings? Have you forgotten the riots taking place? Have you forgotten what has been done to you, which had a big impact? One shouldn't underestimate it. I mean, the, uh, amongst the uh, Marines who protested finally and joined the anti-war movement, African-American Marines probably were in a majority. I don't have the exact statistics now. So we, we witnessed all that. And you know, so you come back from, from an intense, I was there for six weeks, traveling every day, seeing it all. <clears throat> And then, and then you come back into the sort of normality and calm of, uh, of Europe. Uh, and it's like George Orwell wrote in Homage to Catalonia, that you know, where he'd gone to fight with the Catalans against Franco. Uh, he said, you know, the worst thing that can happen to you, you come back from this intensive engagement with political clashes, wars, and you find that the milk is being delivered every day and that once a week the new statesman will come through your door. He said it's very off-putting, that you're so normal when such horrors are going on. But that's why the, the anti-war movement grew so rapidly, is that people weren't prepared to take it, you know. And, I mean, it's the finest period, I think, in American history that such a huge anti-war movement developed in that country. It has no precedent in the imperial history of any other country. What the French did to the Algerians, both in Algeria and in France, is horrific. And there were people who protested, but there was no big mass movement against the Algerian war in France. Likewise in Britain, for, you know, it's hundreds of years as an empire, there were good people who said, this is bad, atrocious, no big mass movement. The United States, there was a big mass movement. So, yes. so sorry. Sorry, no, go on, go on. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> on this point, let me finish. I yeah. mean, it's unheard of in imperial history to see over 100,000 soldiers, Marines, ex Marines, uh, some serving, coming outside the Pentagon in 1971 demonstrating outside the Pentagon with their, on their crutches, without their legs, with all their purple hearts and the medals they've received, and demanding not just that the Americans get out of Vietnam, but saying that they wanted the Vietnamese to win. Mm. That was astonishing. <clears throat> and that has never been repeated. But that has also uh, uh, something which never happened in any other country. So I want to bring us back to the tribunal specifically, and you, I think that's your water right yeah. there. Oh, I think you got a glass. I think that's mine, that's yours. Right. This is no, yours. that's yours. This is yours. This is mine. There we go. Empty glass. <laughs> so you, that's Gary's glass. Oh, okay. So you, you, you come back from Vietnam, you write up your report, and then several months later you fly into Stockholm, and so there's this footage of you actually delivering your, your evidence, and it's my fault entirely that we don't have it to show tonight, but uh, what, it, it's quite striking, right? You, you, there's, there's testimony from uh, North Vietnamese sort of who, who take off their clothes and reveal their scarred bodies from the torch they've endured from the, the napalm. Uh, what, what was that like to, to well, the be speaking? <coughs> The tribunal itself, the Vietnamese presentations were the most dramatic. I mean, uh, on some of the footage, you know, you see the face of some of the judges as they see these people who've come from North Vietnam. I mean, you look at Simone de Beauvoir's face as she sees a child, you know, with his back completely burnt. It's not that people didn't know these things were not happening. They did, but actually to confront it you know, just in front of you like that, shook many of the people who were uh, presiding over the tribunal. And look, the tribunal was, you know, it was an attempt to shame the Western world into tolerating all 
States into seeing that the Geneva Convention was being violated every single day. It was to show that uh, the Nuremberg Tribunal, no lessons had been learned. It was as if the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal was something very specific to the Germans alone and couldn't apply to anyone else. And this angered uh, uh, people, and that's why the War Crimes Tribunal was a partial success, in my opinion. Partial because the aim, and the Americans were invited. We invited the American government to send their attorney general to defend themselves, which they didn't do. And the line was basically, these things are not exaggerations. They didn't happen. And then not so long after the War Crimes Tribunal, the My Lai Massacre was, happened. And every single newspaper in the world reported it. But the My Lai Massacre, even to this day, people think there was only one massacre. There were hundreds of massacres like that which happened in Vietnam. Hundreds. I, I, I give you one awful example of sort of simple, plain violation of every right under the sun. During the Iraq war, I was at a literature festival in Chicago talking on Iraq and other issues. And there was a great deal of horror at the torture photographs that had come out mm -hmm. from Abu Ghraib prison, showing actually sexual torture of male and female prisoners. The female prisoners, what they were forced to do <clears throat> was not shown because the Pentagon just sat on them because they said this will create havoc all over the uh, world. The men, what they got women prisoners to do was shown. I mean, these were sort of little fa uh, things you send back on the cameras which suddenly came out and people were shocked. And I'm sitting on the platform looking at the people mostly. They had no idea that this, of course, it was awful, but it's nothing compared to what they did in Vietnam. And that, before I could say anything, <coughs> uh, African-American, I think he was, or was he white? I can't remember. Uh, Ex-GI who'd fought in Vietnam put his hand up and the chair said yes. He said, I fought in Vietnam and you people who are shocked by this and you're right to be shocked by it, let me tell you something, what I saw with my own eyes. Two prisoners, Vietnamese prisoners, were brought in before us, a team of Marines, and an officer said to one, they, we wanted to find out where their platoon was so we could go and take them by surprise and destroy it. One of them, uh, we, we said to one of them, you know, if you don't uh, tell us we're going to, you'll suffer a horrible fate. The man didn't talk. So he said, we disemboweled him in front of his fellow Vietnamese. We disemboweled him and said to the other one, that's what's going to happen to you unless you tell us where your platoon is engaged and where they are. The other guy didn't talk. He said, we just shot him dead. People were stunned in this hall with about several hundred people. And he said, that's what we did. So don't think any of this, what's happening in Iraq, is new. So I want, I want to touch on two, two issues mm. remaining. Um, and the first, I want to come back to the, the, the question of the Nuremberg legacy. But mm. first, specifically in your presentation to the, the tribunal, you've written that you, you talked about the, the American, you know, so both about the things that you actually saw on the ground, right, this sort of factual reportage, but also about the conflict in general and the American you know, imperialism in Vietnam. But, but on your telling, it wasn't simply imperialism writ large, right? There was a, a racialized element to this, right? And I think this <coughs> led to some disagreement with Isaac Deutscher, one of the, 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 the judges. Uh, and I'm curious to, to, to hear about what, what your analysis of the conflict was, what this racialized <coughs> dimension was that was absent from, from other you know, left-wing well, observers' analysis. I mean, I just noticed, you know, it was difficult not to, uh, that the language used in talking about the Vietnamese, uh, how they were described was completely <coughs> racist. You know, this is how Asian people are, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it wasn't a brilliant discovery on my part. It was just normal, and I noticed it. 
And I started thinking, would they behave like this or would they torture like this mm -hmm. if they were invading a European country? After all, the Second World War had taken place at that time, it seemed closer than it is now. And the horror when any British prisoner was tortured in a German prisoner of war camp. And in, by and large, they weren't. They weren't. Neither in Germany <coughs> nor in Britain did German or British prisoners of war suffer torture like we're talking about. I mean, for them, torture was, you know, not being receiving parcels and things like that. Uh, of course, the prisoners taken from the Untermensch, the, the lower people, whether they were uh, Jews, as we know what happened there now very well, what happened to the Slavs, the people in Russia, Ukraine, mega destruction. But to each other, these imperial powers didn't do that much. I'm glad, by the way, you know, they didn't. But that's how all the others should have been treated too, prisoners of war. So, and the racial <coughs> violence, if you look, there's a two or three very powerful books about the racial language used against the Japanese during the Second World War, which couldn't have been used against the Germans or even the Italians, but was used, and that was totally racial and racialist. So this was a continuation, and the Korean War, and then <clears throat> the Vietnam War. The language used was racist. They're sort of subhumans. And I noticed this at the time and raised it. And one of the historian Isaac Deutscher criticized me from the you know, the tribunal bench, saying, are you 100% sure that the United States wouldn't do this to a white country? I said, well, how can I be 100% sure? You know, this is sort of, we're speculating. But I don't think they could, they would do it in the same way as they've done it in Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. So there was some debate uh, on this issue, and after all, we'd seen the torture of Algerians mm -hmm. uh, in, in France, uh, carried out by French colonial troops, which was not so dissimilar, and in Vietnam. I mean, there's sort of very powerful books written by French historians and films made by French filmmakers showing how the French treated the Vietnamese. So it wasn't that new, the Americans, uh, carried on, you know, in there, giving it their own specific uh, language. So I, can I just, yeah, go ahead, pop in here. I mean, at, at Nuremberg and, and Tokyo, there were quite famous dissenting judgments. Justice Powell's defense at the Tokyo War Crimes, a dissent at the Tokyo War Crimes trial. Was, I mean, how much disagreement was there uh, amongst the judges at the Brussels, the Brussels, the Russell Tribunal. Look, that's what I, I, you know, I was going to say that this was not a tribunal created by any state. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was a tribunal essentially created by philosophers, lawyers, and activists who were strongly opposed to the war. So there was no pretense that this was, if you like, an impartial tribunal because it was a response to what the political culture in these societies was refusing to acknowledge, that huge crimes were being committed in Vietnam. So the legality of the tribunal was from the beginning dubious. You know, it wasn't that. It was a sort of act of resistance to a war, but an act carried out through this particular form. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think. I don't think on the final judgment there was any, there was any disagreement. I think in the before the final judgment of the Russell South Tribunal was written, there were discussions as mm. to language because I know that the lawyer from Pakistan said no, this is a wrong, this should not be, this has no place in it, and changed it as with a legal mind to make it more legal. But essentially, it wasn't that. You know, it was an appeal, really, to people who knew and had some power to do something about it, saying, we are, you know, 
largely amateurs are setting up a war crimes tribunal, you should be doing it. Mm. So, so this was essentially my question to you. So this is the, the central paradox of the tribunal, right? At least from, for, for lawyers. Uh, on the one hand, it was, it, it presented itself as a tribunal. There were constant references to Nuremberg, right? Uh, and indeed, it, it, you know, it, it, it had a, had witnesses. It had lots of the trappings of a, of a judicial trial or tribunal. Indeed, as, as you said initially in the planning stages, you should have the, the his name escapes me. Ah, um, Kazuri, right? The, the Pakistani judge, because he's a good, ju uh, or sorry, lawyer, because he's a good judicial figure. The the judgment that was handed down. 50 years ago last Friday was a judgment. It was framed in very sort of legalistic terms. And yet, on the other hand, it was clearly not, right? It never had the pretense of being a, a, a sort of, it was always this quasi-judicial character to it. And indeed, um, you know, so Sartre and, and Russell were both very forthright. They said, I think it's Russell's opening statement to the second session. He said, we are not judges, we are witnesses. Our task is to make mankind bear witness to these terrible crimes and to unite humanity on the side of justice in Vietnam. I think Russell said explicitly, look, if, if we're not, sure, we're all biased, but if you know anything about this and you're not biased, then there's, then there's well. something fucked up, right? I'm paraphrasing <clears throat> Sartre loosely there. Uh, so, so, and yet, so much of the criticism that was directed at the tribunal at the time, and even today, if you, you read some, some more recent sort of reflections, is of the nature that it was, sort of, it, was a, it, it, it was biased, it wasn't a real tribunal, right? And yet, they were forthright, right? This isn't a tribunal, but there was all these trappings of, of, of the judicial machinery, right? So there's just an interesting tension. And, and yeah, well, you know, as I said, that was an interesting uh, tension. But um, it, that wasn't the, the aim was not to get justice in the sense of what the aim of a tribunal today is or should be. Uh, the aim was to open the eyes of the world at a time when this wasn't being done and saying, look, this is what is going on. Here is the evidence we have brought. Uh, study it, see what you think, do something about it. <clears throat> to say, as some said, but both sides commit crimes. I mean, to compare uh, two powers so unequal in every way, one having total control of the air, bombing day in and day out, the other having nothing in the air. It's just a joke to say that the, there was uh, uh, equality. And the Vietnamese certainly didn't uh, kill prisoners. Even uh, McCain, who was taken prisoner when I was in Hanoi, he parachuted out. I mean, the restraint shown by the peasants who captured him. I mean, these are people who've been bombed by these guys. But there was a discipline, too. Don't kill any American pilots that you capture. That is not our position. They shall be imprisoned. Um, and that is uh, effectively, effectively what... Uh, so, you know, it, it's, the aim was not, and everyone was clear about this, we had no legal power, we had absolutely no legal standing, we were screaming, it was a, a scream of rage to the world, look, are you going to do something or not? And after me lie, the size of the anti-war movement in the United States doubled when they said that these guys, you know, these sort of people would have been telling us and talking about war crimes, and now everyone's admitting it, that there have been war crimes. And from that point of view, I think uh, it, 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 was a, it was a success. I mean, it had a huge impact inside, in other parts of the world, not necessarily the Western world. But those were... So, so there was very, Le Monde covered it a little, but, but it was almost no mainstream press in the, the US. Or they were all there, but they didn't, maybe they wrote reports which weren't printed. No, no, the, the uh, so, so New York Times guy was there, the Guardian had a correspondent there, but the coverage was very weak and... Uh, but there was a lot of coverage in the third world, right? There was a lot Although of presumably 
they knew what was going on already in yeah. Vietnam. Yeah, but they did cover it. I mean, it was covered in, you know, even in Latin American countries which were not at all progressive, but their television stations did cover it, largely because of the prestige of Bertrand Russell and Sartre to a certain extent, uh, that they, they felt that they had to cover it. Similarly, in Africa, I mean, it was covered in Ghana, in Tanzania, in quite a lot of countries in that part of the world. Obviously, in, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, etc., it was covered. But in the Western world, and particularly the United States, which is the you know, country we were targeting to, say, wake up, which was waking up, uh, and I think this helped to a certain extent. You know, I, I don't have any doubt about that. But beyond that, it's very difficult to say was it successful or unsuccessful. How can we say it? You know, it was just it was the moral power of the tribunal that we wanted to exert. You know, we had no states as such behind us. I certainly, remember the New York Times on Friday had a carried an op-ed that was was very sort of generous to the tribunal's legacy. I didn't see that. Oh, it's, I can't remember. It's, I think it's a history student somewhere it's in the U.S. who wrote PhD it. Student. PhD student, yeah. But, it was, but, but it, you know, in the opinion papers of the pages of the Times was this glowing endorsement of the, the tribunal and, and the finding that the, the United States had indeed committed war crimes. Well, no one denies it now, you know. I mean, <clears throat> under, under, during the Reagan period, a huge attempt was made to cover up the war crimes again and to say that it wasn't as bad and, you know, a lot of people from the far right uh, in that administration saying the, we didn't lose the war, we didn't lose the war, it was a setback, but you lost the war. The only time the United States has lost a war in its entire history, they were, they were defeated militarily and politically by the Vietnamese. And that is not a small thing. But they never accepted uh, this and said, if only we'd sent in more troops, mm. yeah, we could have won that war. But it was beyond that, as these documentaries show. Ken Burns's documentaries, if they show one thing, they showed that sending in more troops was not going to work. A, because the resistance was very strong and getting stronger every day, and B, because you couldn't trust your own soldiers. I mean, the, if, you, if you look at the statistics of that period, lots of uh, American uh, casualties, I mean, not lots in the scale of th things, but quite a few officers were being shot dead from behind, mm -hmm. killed by their own soldiers. So the, the, the combination of the Vietnamese struggle the anti-war movement and dif divisions within the conscript American army itself made it very difficult for that war to be continued. And they accepted, they accepted the defeat. And since then, two things have happened. One is that conscription is gone because they realized that there's a democratic side to conscription, that if everyone has to go and fight, then the, the kids who are going to fight try and study where they are going and their parents and other close relations keep, uh, keep in touch, want to know what's going on. But when you don't have a conscript army, interest in imperial wars dies down, as you know, that's happened in Iraq where there are still troops, Afghanistan, etc., etc. So, Aicha, you were at the um, foundation of the uh, Iraq, the World Tribunal in Iraq. I, I, I'm curious to know uh, whether Tariq's story about the foundations of the, of the Russell Tribunal resonated for you. I mean, how, how, how did the World Tribunal come about? Who constituted it? What sort of questions uh, arose? Well, the World Tribunal on Iraq wasn't initiated by philosophers. Really, it was initiated by global anti-war activists all over the world who, in the aftermath of February 15, 2003, when the largest global anti-war protest human history had ever seen had happened a month before the war was actually initiated. And people were very, the New York Times, I think, declared it the global anti-war movement the second superpower on Earth. 
And people were very much empowered by the sense of the uh, gigantic nature of the opposition to the war in Iraq before the war actually had begun. And there was great disappointment. We, I will say we, because I was part of this global anti-war movement. I was living in New York City as a PhD student, and I participated in it, and there was a great disappointment when the war began, despite the emergence of this largest movement the world had ever seen against a war before its initiation. It was a disappointment, but it was a sense of empowerment as well that I want to emphasize. So the memory of the Russell Tribunal was pivotal in activists coming up with the idea of putting the US and UK and other coalition forces on trial for crimes we knew were going to be committed in Iraq once the war had begun. So the memory of the Russell Tribunal was very much alive uh, for especially the generation of 1968, and people were looking for ways to gain visibility. I'm talking about the anti-war movement, were looking for ways to gain visibility and audibility uh, to make their dissent and opposition to the war assume public stage somewhere, somehow. I first learned about the World Tribunal on Iraq, which was yet to be named, in the summer of 2003, so a couple of months after the initiation of the war in March. I was told by friends in Istanbul that there was, there was going to be an international tribunal on Iraq modeled after the Russell Tribunal. They asked me if I wanted to get involved and if I wanted to go back to New York and help built the New York City session of the tribunal. One of the differences between the Russell Tribunal and the World Tribunal on Iraq was the World Tribunal on Iraq was organized as a network of about 20 sessions that happened around the world. I, even I have a hard time keeping it in memory. So between 2003 and 2005, there were tribunal sessions in Barcelona, Brussels, Copenhagen, Genoa, Hiroshima, Istanbul, Lisbon, London, Mumbai, <coughs> New York, Ostersund, Paris, Rome, Seoul, Stockholm, Tunis, and in many cities of Japan and Germany. So this was a network of tribunal sessions organized by local committees uh, that came together in a networked fashion. And the final session of the tribunal happened in Istanbul in June 2005. Uh, there was a jury of conscience. Uh, there were no prosecution and no defense, really. There was what we call the jury of conscience, and its spokesperson was the Indian novelist Arundhati Roy. And the spokesperson for what was called the panel of advocates was the famous international lawyer, Professor Richard Falk. So I got involved when the idea was first initiated, and it Actually, the Russell Foundation was pivotal in linking people because when the idea simultaneously occurred to people who didn't know each other all around the world, preliminary research quickly led to the Russell Foundation and the memory of the Russell Tribunal. And the Russell Foundation in England was pivotal in linking all these local groups and anti-war movements that didn't know each other were linked by the Russell Foundation and also the World Social Forum and the European Social Forum, which were happening at the time as um, conglomerations of the global anti-capitalist movement or the alter-globalization movement also facilitated the exchange of ideas between different anti-war activists and groups all around the world. So it was, I, may I say that I think it was more grassroots um, in my estimation than the Russell Tribunal in the way it was organized. Of course, we had the benefit of the, it was before the time of social media, but there was still the internet, which very much facilitated the networking to realize the <coughs> global World Tribunal on Iraq idea. 
I could speak for hours about this, so please do. Um, but I was going to ask a question mm. about the, this idea of bias. Uh, that lawyers are obsessed yes. with. You know, it's boring. Yeah. I know, but you, 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 in your book, you, you talk about partisan legitimacy, which I found, you know, a very provocative yes. idea. So uh, could you partisan expand on that? Partisan legitimacy. I, one of the charges uh, against the idea of a world tribunal on Iraq was that how can you hold the tribunal? You know that you are going to blame the US and the UK for war crimes. You know before the fact of the tribunal what you are going to come up with. And um, I mean, there was great debate among the organizers themselves. Among Jayan can speak to this as well. Uh, about how the tribunal should be organized, whether it should mimic official institutions of law, whether there should be a defense, whether it should be a, a civil society replication of legal procedures or not. And in the end, I, each session that I counted, all these uh, local sessions had autonomy to decide in which form they would actually constitute the tribunal. So the World Tribunal on Iraq looked very different in local articulations. But for the final session in Istanbul, um, the idea was that one didn't need to replicate official forms of law um, to be able to judge legitimately the justness of the war and the justness of the occupation. So what I tried to theorize as partisan legitimacy is a sense of legitimacy that comes from taking a political position and saying, yes, this is an anti-war tribunal. That, um, that's a conclusion in itself that needs to be shown to people and reclaimed rather than saying, no, no, we will do this neut as neutrally as possible. So it was a reclamation of a partisan or political positioning par excellence. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for both of you uh, mm -hmm. on this question. So, so Tor and I are lawyers, and we're, th we're probably thinking, uh, on one hand, it might be that you're, you're co-opting law for some you know, moment uh, of resistance in history. But the danger, of course, is always that you get co-opted by law. So, so the question I would have is, you know, why, why would activists choose a tribunal mm -hmm. in the first place, um, given the uncertain history of law in relation to resistance? I mean, law's often, of course, been a tool used against resistance and against social movements. And the history of tribunals, which are terribly equivocal, as, as, as Tariq mentioned. The Nuremberg War Crimes Trial did nothing about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, so the form um, seems tainted somehow already. Now, you're obviously trying to redeem it in some way, but... Uh, Do you want to start? You start. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the first thing I need to say is the activists of the World Tribunal on Iraq, I'll call it the WTI by its acronym, were very much aware of this tendency of co-optation. So it, it's not like activists walk into the tribunal form totally unaware of its capacity to co-opt them. That said, it was a diverse, very diverse coalition of activists from international lawyers who believed in the stories that international law tells about itself, um, who certainly believed uncritically in a global rule of law. So from that spectrum, a coalition of international lawyers to anarchists. I mean, there were anarchist activists who had very, uh, um, uh, let's say all kinds of suspicions about law and the rule of law and forms of law. Um, one thing is that it's true that the tribunal form was readily associated with ideas of reclaiming justice. Perhaps it was too readily associated with that and it was easy to claim uh, as a form of demanding justice for the Iraqi people and demanding justice for what the Istanbul session would call the violation of the will of the anti-war movement. Um, um, so it appealed to a certain kind of liberal constituency, including international lawyers, 
But it also, the form of a tribunal appealed to those who remembered the Russell Tribunal with great fondness and admiration and great respect. It was thought that the Russell Tribunal endowed this effort with some kind of historical legitimacy. Uh, so it was, yes, in the tradition of Nuremberg, but the WTI consciously placed itself in the tradition of People's Tribunals and the Russell Tribunal in particular. Also, um, the tribunal offered a theatrical form. I think this was important, where its theatricality and performativity appealed to people, where witnesses could appear. We had lots of witnesses coming in from Iraq. There were journalists who had been to Iraq who came to testify um, um, legal determinations or legal suggestions as well as political analysis could be provided in the form of a tribunal. Um, so for all these reasons, um, and perhaps most of all for providing a global platform where anti-war dissent and anti-war politics could appeal, appear publicly and give voice to the people of Iraq who were attacked by uh, this war in terrible ways, which was demonstrated by the World Tribunal on Iraq. There is a book called uh, Making the Case Against War, the World Tribunal on Iraq, and <clears throat> all the proceedings of the final session in Istanbul has actually been published. So I'm not repeating the horrors that we saw there, but the theatric theatri theatricality of the um, tribunal as an ancient forum for acting and acting politically cannot be underestimated mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jay? Uh, I had the advantage of coming into this as a very bad lawyer. So mm -hmm. uh, although I was trained in law, I didn't have much faith in it. So my approach to it was, I mean, sort of, I'm curious that in this conversation, uh, the tribunal, has, there's been a, a, a sense of defensiveness in the way in which we speak of the tribunal. So yes, yes, we were doing a tribunal, but mm -hmm. we weren't, we were fully aware that we weren't doing something that was properly legal, uh, we didn't have any legality, or the, sort of the power of law to co-opt. I started, my involvement started from a different perspective, which was the power of the idea, the power of the imagination lay not in its association with the law, mm -hmm. but to me it lay in its association with judgment. And I think we equate uh, the tribunal format with law too readily. The language of law or the institutions of law are merely one site, one location, one process of doing judgment. And what was interesting to me was the assertion of, for want of a better expression, of a, the assertion of a right to judge mm -hmm. that was being appropriated by, uh, by, by people's movements as such. And in many instances, the right to judge or the doing of judgment entails or involves judging power, entails judging law in that respect. And to me, that was the most interesting aspect of the tribunal movement. I was involved, prior to getting involved with the WTI, I was working with the Lelio Basso Foundation, who were the coordinators of the Permanent People's Tribunal in Rome. Um, mm -hmm. And I was very inspired by the story of the Permanent People's Tribunal, and prior to that, the, the Bertrand Russell Tribunal. But I think a mistake that we make is that we take the experience of the Russell Tribunal out of its context, mm. and we follow its model as opposed to its spirit. And I think we need to differentiate the context of the Russell Tribunal <coughs> as being one which was imagined and activated at a time of the high water mark, if you like, of anti-imperial sentiment and activism around the world. So there was a political sense of hope and conviction that the world could be changed mm -hmm. and the legacy of the Nuremberg normative standards as articulated after the Second World War was a force that could be mobilized in order to change the world in anti-imperial uh, terms and imaginations. So there was a faith in law, I think. There was yeah. a faith in the justice of the doing of law in that context as a transformatory force. I don't think that applies today. I think we need to reimagine what it means to think anti-imperially. Um, and I, a part of the problem, the difficulty, I think, that the World Tribunal in Iraq faced was that we didn't go through that process of thinking sufficiently. 
Yeah. There was an over eagerness to do the Russell Tribunal mm -hmm. because that was a model. That was something we could do. Uh, and there was a lot of activism, a lot of energy that, uh, that centered around that prospect of the ability mm -hmm. to have this theatrical tribunal doing without sufficiently asking the question, mm. for what? Yeah, I won't, oh, sorry. Just, just to I finish off, yeah. I think a different, also another context mm -hmm. is the Russell Tribunal, lots of things that Tariq spoke about, uh, some things were known, some things were not. The, the sort of the overarching uh, idea that moved the tribunals was this notion of acting against the crime of silence. In the context of Iraq, there was no silence. Exactly. Yeah. It was not that the crime of silence or the, the crimes that were being committed, the wrongs that were being done was not known. It was not that there were no voices of objection, of resistance, of opposition. All of this was known. So the context of anti-imperial activism, I think it was very different. And I don't think that was grasped. And increasingly, there is a tendency, I think, in the tribunals movement to continue replicating the model without taking stock and saying, we need to understand what imperialism in the current contemporary context is, how it operates, uh, what the role of law is within it, and how then to imagine differently assertions of people's rights to judgment. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a, a much broader uh, and more difficult thing to do than, mm -hmm. than simply imagining a tribunal as an activity. Can I <coughs> just, uh, sorry, I should. That's all right. Yeah. Um, uh, co comment on that. I agree very strongly with uh, what has been said. And if you even look at the Iraq, anti Iraq war demonstrations, mm. they were huge, okay, on one level. In numerical terms, they were the largest demonstrations against a war that have ever taken place on the same day globally. I mean, the figures are astonishing. Over a million in London, uh, two million in Rome, a million and a half in Madrid, uh, in American cities, 100,000 in New York. Two, oh, more. More than that, more than that. In virtually every American capital, provincial capital, huge on the West Coast, the smallest were in France, where the intelligentsia is sort of more or less dead on these matters. But by and large, they were huge. And yet, hmm. they were preemptive demonstrations, and large numbers of people who participated in them had never been on a demonstration before. And they really believed, to their enormous credit, that by coming out on this day, they could stop the war in Iraq. Many people I spoke to said, we, we failed. I said, we, we failed because you shouldn't have believed that they're going to listen to us. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was that with the exception of Britain, where an anti-war movement continues, everywhere else, the anti-war movement came to an end after this failure of, of not being able to stop the war. In Vietnam, it, during those days, it was the exact opposite. The movement grew slowly, helped by things like the Russell Tribunal and others, till it reached its, uh, its apogee. One more point I want to make is that all the current tribunals, and this applies to the Nuremberg Tribunal as well, however else you characterize it, were victors' tribunals. These were tribunals set up by winning sides in the case of Nuremberg in the Second World War. In the case, as we see going on at the moment, dramatic episodes happening, set up by the West, the winning side in the Yugoslav War, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They are not normative, these tribunals. You know, there are no norms attached that it's the crimes of the defeated side which are discussed. In the case of uh, <clears throat> Iraq, there's no tribunal, but the idea was strong, like Tony Blair, for instance, being regarded by a sizable section of the population when the vote or the opinion polls revealed as a war criminal. Uh, and I mean, I remember activists here going around all the big book bookshops and chains when Blair's biography came out and moving it from the politics section to the crime section. 
So something happened. In, you know, people were angry that nothing more uh, could be done. But the, so the tribunals, the Russell Tribunal, and even the Iraq Tribunals and others, which are the Yugoslav Tribunals, which were set up, were an attempt by the victims to speak with the help of the victims. These were victims' tribunals, whereas the official ones are victors' tribunals. And what the victors' tribunals always uh, prevent you from doing is trying the war crimes of the, the, the other side. In the case of Iraq, huge. I mean, if you think about it, over a million people killed, civilian deaths, five million orphans, officially declared by the governments in Iraq set up by the occupation, five million orphans. Uh, the deaths of Iraqis weren't even counted. Or of uh, you know in Libya, or Syria, what's happened uh, since? So it's quite a horrific situation legally, but what we used to regard the struggle for human rights as something quite progressive has now almost become part and parcel of the ideology of the present times, used to justify wars. Uh, it's happened time and time again. So there's been a big, big shift in the, in the world since the Vietnam War. And what form it should take, you talked about theatricality. There's a Brazilian, great Brazilian uh, playwright and uh, theatrical yeah. genius. What's, what's his, his name? name? Oh. P starts with P or? Is it the theater? Theater of the Oppressed. Yeah. Theater of the Oppressed. Yes. Augusto Boal. Boal, Boal. Augusto yeah. Boal, who sets up yeah. these things. You yeah. know, there's the sets up tribunals to try landlords of oppressing yeah. uh, the peasants of Brazil. It's very theatrical and quite effective now, especially because it's filmed. I mean, I was thinking as I was mm. coming here mm. that if we'd filmed that tribunal, if we, the Vietnam, it wasn't even filmed completely. You know, there's no actual record of it, apart from a few things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with today's technology, that would have been seen all over the Western world, by on, on, online mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. That's an advantage which today's generations have, that they can communicate to more people than we did. But I think the point made about the very different circumstances in which we operate is very well taken. So I think all three of you touched on this, what I think is a fundamental difference, right, between the, the Russell Tribunal's context and that of, of later tribunals. And so Gary's written or touched on this in some of his writing, this, this <coughs> emergence of, so how to put it. With the Russell Tribunal, there is no official tribunal at this time, right? Nuremberg's the closest model we have. Uh, the opposition to the, it takes place in the context of a mass anti-war movement. It wasn't no, so mass then. Uh, all right, so not mass, but, but no one's going and protesting the Vietnam War on the basis that it's illegal, yes. right? It's, it's a, opposed to the war on, because it's imperialism, on moral grounds, on normative grounds. Whereas Iraq, there is these examples, there, there are official tribunals, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, the, 2003, the ICC even, right? Uh, and and, and oh, suddenly opposition to the war is expressed in quite disturbingly from my perspective, right? By people on, of the left, right? A, a couching their opposition to the war in legal terms, right? It's, we shouldn't be in Iraq because it's illegal, uh, which seems like, you know, so, so that sucks up so much political energy in this legal, you know, couching one's political arguments in the language of law, which I think is, is very fraught. Um, and so that's a fundamental difference, right? That suddenly the, the idea, right, that, that people say, Bush, Blair, they should be tried in The Hague. Uh, the, the ICC becomes the model of, of making political arguments. Uh, and that's a fundamental difference, I think, in, in how these tribunals operated, right? Or how these wars were opposed through the language of law. Well, well it's, it seemed like at the time of the Russell Tribunal, I was rereading Jean-Paul Sartre's introduction to it, and the great hope he expresses is for the institution of uh, global institution of international law, basically criminal law. International criminal law is the hope he expresses. It, when it, well, when we go forward to the war in Iraq, uh, if you analyze the uh, 
declaration of the World Tribunal on Iraq, for example, it says the war in Iraq was illegal, but that's not the only basis on which it opposed the war in Iraq. This was a great debate among activists of the World Tribunal on Iraq themselves. What, how shall we uh, construct our discourse such <laughs> that the illegality of the war is not the only ground on which our opposition to this war is being expressed and articulated. And one way in the findings, I was rereading it today, the Declaration of the World Tribunal on Iraq's Jury of Conscience expresses, I think, great disappointment with institutions of international criminal law. N finding number five, it says, Established international political legal mechanisms have failed to prevent this attack and to hold the perpetuators accountable. The impunity that the US government and its allies enjoy has created a serious international crisis that questions the import and significance of international law, of human rights covenants, and of the ability of international institutions, including the United Nations, to address the crisis with any degree of authority or dignity. In other words, the declaration of the World Tribunal on Iraq questions these established institutions which Jean-Paul Sartre was hoping would be established and challenging their authority to adjudicate or their incapacity, perhaps, another reading could be, to adjudicate uh, crimes and violations committed by the United States and their allies. So um, I'm not sure if the, um, uh, if this question can be resolved in theory once and for all for the tribunals, as Giant says, I think what we need in the case of these kinds of civil society tribunals is thorough reflection on this problem that you're articulating and uh, other, the other paradox that you mentioned earlier. Uh, you've got sympathetic auditors uh, here in relation to that. I mean, the problem with, mm -hmm. problem with thinking about the war in terms of legality and illegality is that it very nearly was a legal war. Very I mean, all, the, all it required were a couple of states to swing a different way on the Security Council, exactly. yes. and we'd have had yes. a lawful exactly. war. Yeah. Um, so the problem with thinking in terms of illegality and, and legality is that you can be very, very easily outmaneuvered. And in <coughs> fact, something very like that happened. I, I remember, I always tell this story, I, I was listening to Tony Blair on the, on the Today program being interviewed by John Humphreys. Oh. And Humphreys said, you know, it's all gone wrong in Iraq, hasn't it? I mean, really, it, 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 there's, there's the rise of this group and that group, the, the state's falling apart, there's inter-ethnic violence. You know, what do you have to say to that? And Blair said, but you don't understand. There are 13 Security Council resolutions authorizing the war. In other words, the last argument standing was legality. I, I mean, I think that's a reason to be suspicious of, of law. But the other reason to go back, I mean, you know, to go back to Arendt, uh, the, the problem with fantasizing about Blair and Bush being in front of some tribunal is that you'll end up in the same position Arendt was in in Jerusalem when she's confronted with Eichmann and finds him utterly disappointing um, as a representative of, of, of the Nazi war machine. Um, so I, th I think this faith in law has, uh, works in a number of different ways and almost always, I'm so, mm -hmm. sorry to our law students here, disappointing ways. Uh, yeah. but, this, but this is also raises the point that the, the, the tribunal, so the Russell Tribunal and the, the Iraq Tribunal and, and the other, you know, the most recent one is the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, right? Yeah. So the, these are exceptional or, or different from international criminal law tribunals, right? Insofar as they're, they're not obsessed with, or, or, or they don't have their blinkers on, right, this myopic idea of the individual perpetrator of war crimes, right? So in the international criminal law is so focused on the individual, right? Uh, and, and so this, this is fundamentally different insofar as, so Arendt's faced with, with Eichmann, the, the calls for Bush and Blair to be tried are, you know, holds them up as, as somehow individually responsible for things, these things, whereas the Russell Tribunal, right, it was, it was an indictment of, not of, of or Kennedy or, or Johnson or Nixon, right? It was an indictment of U.S. imperialism, right? And the system. Like an actual acknowledgement or recognition that there were structural forces, mm -hmm. logics of imperialism, capitalism at play that undergirded it. And, and, and I was think the only point about mentioning Blair and Bush being tried as war criminals is not that anyone believes that's seriously going to happen. 
but to show the double standards in operation uh, within the legal system that exists today. That's the aim of it. Uh, it's, a people, generous, uh, huh? it's a generous interpretation of some international liberal lawyers. No, I agree with you. No, but, it's, it's, but you know, let's, let, let's see. Some of fact. our colleagues actually it, think that this is even in that should happen. The United States refuses to sign any document which permits any of its citizens, soldiers, officers, politicians, to be tried in any court outside that of the United States itself. Full stop. So, you know, it's to even demand that Bush be tried in The Hague, it's, it, on every, it's not going to happen, because that's mm -hmm. the way the United States rules. It has laws for itself. Uh, which uh, don't apply to others. So the, the thing is, you know, when you're trying these pathetic figures from the different Yugoslav wars, it's, it doesn't make, it doesn't really make any sense because the, the whole business has changed since these courts were even set up. No one takes them that seriously. Everyone knows what their function is. And these judges and lawyers who get paid huge salaries to go and sit as judges and work as lawyers are the ones who come out the best, really. So we're going to bring Jayanne in and then open up for questions for about seven or eight minutes from the uh, audience. I think we're touching on, I mean, you sort of raised the point, I think we're touching on an important problem, uh, which in terms of the WTI was, as Aicha indicated, a real source of debate within the movement. Uh, there were very strong legalistic constituencies who were just, mm. you know, we, mm -hmm. we have to be divorced from the movements, we must not be seen to be associating with them, uh, for this will undermine everything that we are about in terms of doing a legal process. There were the other extreme, which had nothing to do with, didn't have anything to do with, uh, with, with the legal process and such. So it was a, it was a real live debate. But I th the, the point I want to make is that we've we reached a stage now where it is difficult to say what we want. The point has already been, been made that precisely what was hoped for in terms of uh, correcting the void as Sartre put it, you know, we, are, we are doing this because there is a void in international law, uh, in, in institutions of international law. That exists, and we are learning that law does not prohibit imperial designs, it, it facilitates it, it enables it, it, it permits it. Uh, so any sense that a prohibition in terms of law, international criminal law, international humanitarian law is in, in effect a permission, an, an enabler, a facilitator, so the question before any tribunal imagination now is, what is it that we are trying to say? If we are trying to merely say that there has been a violation of law, this is no big deal. So what? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we can be self-satisfied by holding an event and saying, look, we've got, you know, put in a lot of effort and very meticulously gathered the evidence, which is in the public domain anyway, and presented this theater of, of doing a legal process. But that in itself does not achieve very much. The more difficult question is to grasp the, the, the implications of the world in which we live in. What do we do in a world where a violation of the law, even if it is to be regarded as a violation, is of any significance? What is the nature of political movements, political action now, which when appropriating the process of judgment defines what, what to come, <clears throat> what action follows, what is the uh, resistance, imagination, and action to follow from a tribunal deliberation. I think the sort of imagination of a tribunal should be seen as something that begins a process as opposed to yeah. one that culminates. Mm. It's, not, it's not the verdict or the judgment or the statement of the jury of conscience that is important. The far more difficult thing to do is to ask questions about the, the nature in which this is a normality, this violation, this wrong, this violence that is inflicted uh, by the victors upon the victims who are holding this, this uh, on whose behalf such events are held. What happens then? You know, what is, what is mm -hmm. our interaction or our, uh, imp, imp, how do we impinge upon a world where 
it is no big deal to say that such war crimes are being committed. You know, this is a normality of our of our actuality. Okay, so let's 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 open it up for questions for <coughs> five minutes. We'll take them in little groups of two or three. In fact, probably just one group of two or three. We've got a microphone there and a microphone up the back there. We've got one question over at the side there, and one question in the middle. So let's take those two. Um, hi, thank you very much for uh, speaking. It was really interesting. Um, going back to the Vietnam War, uh, it feels like often when you talk about that period of history, um, we use a, a bipolar system where we put the USA on one side with the South Vietnam and China and North Vietnam, uh, which makes me feel a bit uncomfortable because USA has obviously um, committed atrocities to the South Vietnamese as well. And as you pointed out, there was a lot of racism at the time, uh, that sort of or orientalistic ideas of you know Asians as being a sub-human category. Um, so basically my question is, and you also pointed out that all those tribunals have been um, organized by victors. So my question is, there is literally no way for USA to be punished for what they've done. Um, you also pointed out that all the coverage about the Vietnam War was mainly from the US, so supported the US angle. Um, so 50 years after Russell, what What's, what's happening now to prevent those things to happen in the future? Uh, evidently, the Iraq war um, shows that USA is still doing what it does. Um, so the, this notion of human rights, is that even introduced to soldiers that go on the field? Because at the end of the day, people on the fields are the ones committing all these atrocities. Is, that, is the notion of human rights even um, presented to the military when they're being trained? Um, what is there that we can do to change the, um, the way the USA treats um, uh, people um, in a situation of war? Okay, and, and there's a question in the middle here. Uh, <coughs> okay, I am, by the way, a native of Belgrade, which is the only capital in the world that has been bombed by both NATO and the Nazis. So there is some very interesting comparisons that can be made here. But looking further than that, and especially the Yugoslav Tribunal, we can see huge differences that have taken place. The US in Vietnam had the support, or managed to obtain the support, of South Korea, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. It didn't have the support of any European countries. In the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, 19 NATO countries operated with the US bossing them. Let's be quite clear about it. Uh, 70 of them were European, and they were bombing a European country under US control. I mean, this is the most frightening things to me, that one can effectively establish such control over very big countries. Uh, and uh, let's face it, what we are facing now is something very serious, because Russia and China have noticed what's going on, and we are facing a third world war. I know this kind of takes us out of this, but this, this is the new situation that uh, I think Jayan quite clearly kind of pointed out to what, you know, what, what can the rest of us do to stop this. But you may have some comments on this. All right, so, well, let's, let's finish with the panel responding to those two questions if they wish to. Uh, Jayan, do you want to start and then uh, Aicha and Tariq? Um, can you just try to remember the, the crux of your question again, please? Fifty years later, has anything changed? American impunity. Can we do anything about it? Oh yes, I remembered what I wanted to, do, to say to that. Um, one thing that we have not mentioned here is post Russell Tribunal and the involvement, there's the connection with the Permanent People's Tribunal then, was a document in 1976 that was the result of a group of people gathering together, including Lelio Basso, who was part of the Russell Tri Tribunal, who then set up the Lelio Basso Permanent People's Tribunal called the Algiers Declaration of 1976, the Algiers Declaration on the Rights of Peoples. Now this 
a people's declaration, an activist doing, nothing for no formal sanction by any state or international organization or institution, was a statement of resistance, a statement of struggle, recognizing the right of peoples um, to wage struggle against imperialism, against oppression. This document is important, I think, because in its time it articulated an anti-imperial assertion of a right to resist, a right to struggle as such. And I think something like that needs to be rethought. Because if we are merely assuming that the institutions that exist, the international political legal institutions that, uh, that we are familiar with, that structure an imperial globalized system of oppression is going to provide salvation, then it is rather comfortable uh, an assumption. What we don't speak in these contexts are the implications on, and the meaning and the consequences of what anti-imperial struggle means in the contemporary setting. Now that could be an uncomfortable thing for a panel like this to be, a situation like this to be doing, but let's face it, that is the materiality of what we are talking about. Mm. And unless that is grasped, unless we take on board the consequences uh, as to what struggle in the contemporary context might mean, then all of this talk is, simple, is simply futile, in my view. And, and that is, by definition, by necessity, <coughs> even if it's not illegal talk, it certainly is a legal talk. <laughs> okay, I, I would like to say a part of that rethinking has to be the role that human rights plays in actually facilitating empire and imperialism. So I don't think of human rights as necessarily something that is against racism or imperialism or their articulation through militarism, but as Tariq was remarking, it has become the frontline ideology of imperial violence. And part of the rethinking that Jayan is asking us to do has to involve a rethinking of the rights that human rights plays in justifying war and colonial occupation, basically. Um. <clears throat> You know, a number of key things have happened in the world, and without contextualizing them, it's very difficult to understand what is happening and what forms of resistance can take place and who will carry out this resistance. First, very briefly, it was assumed almost automatically by many good thinking people that because the Soviet Union had collapsed, that whole world had gone, mm. it meant imperialism was over. On the contrary, what happened was that what had existed, negatively or positively, however you want to say it, as a block to the most outrageous assumptions <laughs> of imperialism disappeared. And this made the United States a global power, an imperial power, without any precedent at all. They, could, they, they assumed they could do what they wanted in any part of the world and often did. And so the space which used to exist once in the world, which allowed the Europeans not to send troops to Vietnam, was taken away completely, which is why to the question on Yugoslavia, they became part of uh, the, the imperial system, junior partners. Uh, they could be punished, but not the Americans, but they did, they basically did uh, what they were asked uh, uh, to do. The Chinese and Russians are now refusing to go along with, though they did go along with it, we shouldn't forget. I mean, uh, basically Yeltsin could have stopped the war in Yugoslavia, but didn't, chose not to. Uh, Primakov, his prime minister, who tried, was removed very rapidly from office. Uh, the Chinese used to never talk about foreign policy. It was a sort of mystery, you know, what they actually believe, but even now their, their trading partners are under attack, like the threats against Iran, and they're saying we will not 
support any such attack on Iran. So that much has changed, but overall in the global balance, the, the United States rules supreme, in my opinion. Its power has not <clears throat> been taken away. It's not on the decline. This is wishful thinking by and large on the part of people. But another thing has happened, that for a long time the resistance movements were carried out by people who, in general, many respected, even if they didn't agree with them, the liberation movements against the Portuguese <coughs> Empire in Africa, the liberation movements in the Maghreb against the French, uh, the liberation movements against the Dutch, against the British, against all this, had a legitimacy. The main line of resistance these days is coming from groups that say openly that they're religious fundamentalists. They fight with each other as well. And this makes it difficult to launch any big movement, just speaking objectively, against the uh, imperialism today because they look at the enemies and say, well, you know, if they're fighting against that, it must be all right. And what they don't realize, people who think like that, is regardless of the nature and character of the enemy, ask what is happening to your own countries. What laws are being passed to prevent discussion? What universities are allowed and not allowed to discuss? What is the prevent legislation uh, uh, as operated in this country? And the power arrogated to himself by the United States president, that was Obama, not Trump, that the, United, that the American president has the right to order the execution of any American citizen, wherever the citizen might be, if he considers it appropriate in defending US national interests, some such verbiage. So there's no due process. In other words, effectively, it's a form of terror exercised by the state. So unable to deal with the question of terrorism, which is a real problem, and which is linked to the wars, which people don't like to acknowledge, which Jeremy Corbyn did acknowledge and found out that a majority of the people in this country actually agreed with him, because he had the courage to spell it out, that it's our foreign policy which is resulting in some of these terrorist attacks taking place. And they thought they had him, but they didn't. So. It's a difficult one. There are no automatic solutions to, 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 to this because of the world in which we live and act and, and function today, but that doesn't mean we stop. That's the important thing. And how and where people can be the most effective is not universal. There are no universal answers to that particular question today. That's the problem. We have to, which we have to deal with and confront. Because, I mean, you know, nobody in their right mind can believe that ISIS or a group like that, and whether they are funded by the Saudis or the United States or who, I don't care. I'm just saying that this presents a alternative to what is existing today or what exists uh, elsewhere. I mean, it's a nightmare situation and for people in these countries, because the terrorists have killed more Muslims than they've killed anyone else, if you want to do a balance sheet of that. And it's, it's a problem not going to go away. And so I think it's Im incumbent on us who act and are active in these things to point out that it is not unrelated to the wars that are being waged. Why didn't it exist before the wars began? Mm -hmm. This has arisen. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq under Saddam, whatever you might think of it. Al-Qaeda went in with the armies of occupation. That's a fact. Likewise, what is happening today in Syria with ISIS, targeting Shias, targeting the Iranians. So it's a very complex world. And in this complex world, the great empire, that of the United States, defends what it regards as its own national interests. The Europeans go along with it, which is to their eternal shame. Uh, they haven't been able to develop 
um, any alternative to U.S. foreign policy, even when they are insulted day after day by the current president of the United States, they can't break. It's an umbilical cord which has tied them together. There's no one there to snap it. That's the scale of the problem we face, and we have to realize that. So we struggle on, we fight on, but in very difficult circumstances. Okay, I'm going to ask you uh, all to join me um, in thanking our panelists for engaging in that very engaging conversation. So thank you. <laughs>